Good morning. Today is the 11th Sunday after Trinity. Our opening hymn is number 151, sung to the tune of Talus Canon. Awake, my soul, and with the sun, thy daily stage of duty run. Shake off dull sloth and joyful rise to pay thy morning sacrifice. Redeem thy misspent moments past and live this day as if thy last. Improve thy talent with due care for the great day thyself prepare. Let all thy converse be sincere, thy conscience as the noonday clear. Think how all-seeing God thy ways and all thy secret thoughts surveys. Wake and lift up thyself, my heart, and with the angels bear thy part, who all night long unwearied sing high praise to the eternal King. The order for morning prayer begins on page three in your prayer book. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I was glad when they said unto me, We will go into the house of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open now our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth 
and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our psalm this morning is number 33 on page 378 in your prayer book. Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for it becometh well the just to be thankful. Praise the Lord with harp, sing praises unto him with the lute and instrument of ten strings. Sing unto the Lord a new song, sing praises lustily unto him with a good courage. For the word of the Lord is true, and all his works are faithful. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as it were upon a heap and layeth up the deep as in a treasure house. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Stand in awe of him, all ye that dwell in the world. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, and maketh the devices of the people to be of none effect, and casteth out the counsels of princes. The counsel of the Lord shall endure forever, and the thoughts of his hearts from generation to generation. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord Jehovah, and blessed are the folk that he hath chosen to himself to be his inheritance. The Lord looketh down from heaven and beholdeth all the children of men. From the habitation of his dwelling he considereth all them that dwell on the earth. He fashioneth all the hearts of them and understandeth all their works. There is no king that can be saved by the multitude of an host. Neither is any mighty man delivered by much strength. A horse is counted but a vain thing to save a man. Neither shall he deliver any man by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, and upon them that put their trust in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death, and to feed them in the time of dearth. Our soul hath patiently tarried for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have hoped in his holy name. Let thy merciful kindness, O Lord, be upon us, like as we do put our trust in thee. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the eighth verse of the fifth chapter of the book of Job. I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause which doeth great things and unsearchable, 
marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields, to set up on high those that be low, and those which mourn may be exalted to safety. He disappointed the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime, and grope in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty, so that the poor, so the poor that hath no hope, and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despiseth not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore, and bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. Here endeth the first lesson. The Te Deum Laudamus. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable true and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted, let me never be confounded. Here beginneth the ninth verse of the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Here endeth the second lesson. The 
the Benedictus on page 14. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. The Collect for the Eleventh Sunday after Trinity. O God, who declarest thy almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity, mercifully grant unto us such a measure of thy grace that we, running the way of thy commandments, may obtain thy gracious promises and be made partakers of thy heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. 
An interesting thought experiment is to consider what it would be like to meet someone unexpected in heaven. Take, for example, a scene from Dante's Purgatorio, the second volume of his Divine Comedy. In Dante's 14th century epic poem, the Roman poet Virgil uh, guides Dante through hell, purgatory, and heaven. And in the poem, Virgil, who represents the virtue of reason, resides in limbo, which is the entryway to hell, along with Homer and Socrates and other great philosophers and poets of antiquity who lived before Christ or were in some ways a part of the pagan world. It's not quite a punishment to be in limbo, but it's not a reward either. And what Dante is trying to show us there is that reason alone cannot attain heaven. Faith in Christ is necessary. Well, about two-thirds uh, through their journey, Dante and Virgil meet a fellow named Stadius, who is another pagan poet and a devotee of Virgil, who lived just after the time of Christ. Now, Virgil is surprised to see Stadius on the road to heaven rather than in limbo with his fellow philosophers. Stadius tells Virgil and Dante that he secretly came to faith and was baptized when he saw the Christian's courage under imperial persecution. Now, of course, we have no historical evidence that Stadius was indeed a secret convert to Christianity, and indeed that whole kind of um, overarching geography of what Dante is talking about, we would, in a post-Reformation world, definitely question. But Dante is making an interesting point, point in this part about the unexpected mercy of God. And we see the same kind of thing in today's gospel reading, the well-known parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee and the publican. So please open your Bibles to Luke 18, 9, Luke 9, or Luke chapter 18, verse 9, and you can also find this passage in your prayer book on page 205. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So to really understand the impact of the story, we need to understand these two stock characters. In first century Palestine, first century Israel, the Romans were occupying the Holy Land. The current royal dynasty, the Herods, were of questionable Jewish ancestry, and they were definitely not of the Davidic line. They were not the people that should be on the throne according to the scriptures. And culturally, they were Romans, and they were just as pagan as the Romans, because really, um, um, they were vassals of Rome. They were not independent themselves anyway. Now, the tax collectors, or publicans as the King James puts it, were Jewish people who were working for and with Rome. The Romans allowed them to charge whatever they wanted in taxes so long as the proper amount was then given to Rome. So as you can imagine, this led to almost universal corruption and cheating at the expense of the publican's fellow Jews. Imagine a Frenchman who was working with the Nazis during the occupation in the early 1940s, and you'd get um, a picture of the character of the typical tax collector in the story. He was a traitor to his people of, um, and was completely corrupt. That's kind of the stock character. He would rightly have been hated by his countrymen and considered to be among the worst of sinners. Now, the Pharisee, by contrast, would have been seen as, as a good, upright, and pious person by most of Jesus' audience. He's the guy who's at church every time the doors are open. He volunteers to help on all the committees. He's tithing, and he's fasting well beyond what the Old Testament law required. Externally, he's a model Jew, a paragon and good example for his countrymen. Internally, however, for the publican in Jesus' parable, there's something wrong. Rather, for the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, there's something wrong. So let's look at verse 11. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. So whenever we pray, I thank you that I'm not like other men, there's a problem. 
Even though it's dressed up in a veneer of thanking God, it really shows that the Pharisee was actually trusting in himself and looking down on other folks, just like St. Luke says at the beginning of the parable. This is the essence of the sin of pride, which is traditionally seen as one of the seven deadly sins. And it's the one uh, of which the devil himself is most guilty, traditionally speaking. The English reformer John Boys writes, There are four kinds of proud people. One, arrogant people who attribute every good thing in themselves to themselves and not to God. Two, presumptuous people who acknowledge that God is the giver of their, gra- of their grace, but it's because of their own merit, so they deserve the grace that God gives them. Three, those who boast in, of their own eminence, which indeed they do not have. And then four, those who despise others and portray themselves as singular and unique in what they have. And this was the problem of the Pharisee. And indeed, it's often the problem for religious folk like us. It's all too easy to look at ourselves rather than to look at God. It's all too easy to see ourselves as better than the sinners out there. St. Augustine says this is like going to a doctor for the purpose of gloating over the sick people in the waiting room. He writes this, The Pharisee was not rejoicing so much in his own clean bill of health as in comparing it with the diseases of others. He came to the doctor. It would have been more worthwhile to inform him, that is the doctor, to inform him by confession of the things that were wrong with himself instead of keeping his wounds secret and having the nerve to crow over over the scars of others. And in fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria says that this is evidence of the spiritual sickness in the Pharisee and, by extension, us when we're in a Pharisaical mindset. He writes this, No one who is in good health ridicules one who is sick for being laid up and bedridden. He is rather afraid, for perhaps he may become the victim of similar sufferings. A person in battle, because another has fallen, does not praise himself for having escaped from misfortune. The weakness of others is not a suitable subject for praise for those who are in good health. The tax collector, on the other hand, unlike the Pharisee, the publican, the tax collector, realizes he's in trouble. Let's pick up with verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So as liturgical Christians, we're familiar with the Kyrie eleison prayer, Lord, have mercy upon us. In fact, um, at Holy Communion, this is something we pray almost every week in the classical Anglican tradition. But the word for mercy that's used by the tax collector is a little bit different in the Greek. Rather than um, the usual eleos, which is where we get the eleison from, right? He uses a different word, elasthete, which carries the idea of propitiation or atonement along with mercy. It's not just mercy, but it's also a mercy that atones. A mercy that atones. The tax collector realizes his sins, and he realizes that they need to be dealt with. He needs someone to atone for him. This realization, this repentance, is why he was justified and the Pharisee was not. Justification is legal language, meaning to be shown or declared righteous. The judge has banged his gavel and the sentence is not guilty. The Lord covered and paid for the tax collector's sins, and the tax collector was therefore declared righteous righteous. He received the Lord's righteousness. The Pharisee, on the other hand, failed to realize his need for propitiation, his need for atonement. He failed to repent, and thus he remained in his unrealized unrighteousness. 
Though this was a parable, we do have actual tax collectors in the Gospels who, in a similar way, repented and followed Jesus. So in the very chapter that follows today's Gospel reading, so up in chapter 19 of St. Luke, um, we, see, we have the story of Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, who demonstrates his repentance by paying back those he cheated fourfold. At the end of that passage, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also was a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's in Luke 19, 9 and 10. And then, of course, we have St. Matthew, one of the four evangelists, one of the four gospel writers, who was himself a tax collector before Jesus called him. And in Matthew chapter 9, we see uh, Matthew leaving his custom booth behind to follow Jesus and even brings, as the text says, many tax collectors and sinners to Jesus. God indeed shows his mercy to the worst of sinners. But what about the Pharisee? Is there any mercy for him? Is there any hope for him? After all, in our day, Pharisee has become a a synonym. It's become synonymous with the legalistic hypocrite. If you call someone a Pharisee, you're not saying they're pious and upright, you're saying they're a legalistic hypocrite. Does Jesus offer the Pharisee mercy and atonement? Well, for the answer to that, we can look to the traditional epistle reading from Holy Communion today in Philippians chapter three, and because we see that St. Paul, who wrote Philippians three, was himself a Pharisee. So Philippians 3, 4 through 8, we read this. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. So in that traditional epistle reading that we have from 1 Corinthians 15, so that's a different passage. Our, Our traditional epistle reading today is 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, St. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. So if God can save Zacchaeus, Matthew, and Paul, he can save you and me. Whether we're traitors and cheats like the tax collectors, or whether we're puffed up Pharisees like Paul, or whatever else is the sin problem in our life. God's grace is indeed not in vain. And I don't know about you, but I look forward to seeing many tax collectors and sinners, and yes, even Pharisees, when by God's grace and by our Lord Jesus' blood, I stand before his throne. And we say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The service continues on page 18 with the prayers for the state and for the church. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. 
More especially, we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate. that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be infinitely thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 152, also to the tune of Talus Canon. All praise to thee who safe hast kept and hast refreshed me while I slept. Grant, Lord, when I from death shall wake, I may of endless light partake. Lord, I my vows to thee renew, Disperse my sins as morning dew, Guard my first springs of thought and will, And with thyself my spirit fill. Direct control suggest this day all I design or do or say, that all my powers with all their might in thy soul glory may unite. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us go forth in joy to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.